Well, good morning and welcome back. Uh, almost good afternoon, I guess, for a lot of us. Um, welcome back to the Cleveland Hub World's Fair. Hey, I am excited about this next presentation. Uh, we've got Stellantis uh, on with us this afternoon, and we're going to talk about panel shingling uh, or laughing of panels. And I know as technicians, when we're working on vehicles, oftentimes we think, like, who the heck designed this thing? And why isn't this, you know, why isn't it more serviceable? And we're removing panels that may not be damaged in a lot of cases to access spot welds on damaged panels. And um, this is an opportunity for us to hear from a vehicle manufacturer some of the reasons behind that. Uh, they don't just arbitrarily do it, right? There's a there's design intent behind it. And so we're going to talk about that uh, today. Uh, we've also got an update on some welds through primer studies that uh, Solange has been undertaking. And uh, so we're really looking forward to uh, getting some great information. So uh, without any uh, further ado, I want to introduce our, our guests today. We've got uh, uh, both Patrick Porter and Lynn Rogers. Lynn, if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and who you're with. Uh, I'd appreciate that very much. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. Yeah, my name is Lynn Rogers. I'm the body collision lead for Stellantis. And uh, I work closely with uh, our production engineering team as well as material science. So that's my background. Awesome. Awesome. Patrick, go ahead. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Patrick Porter. I am the technical compliance director for the Assured Performance Network and OEC company. And of course, we work with uh, Stellantis in a lot of areas. And I help build a lot of the, those technical questions that come in and work with Lynn and all of his team to uh, help get those answers out. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. So, um, hey, Lynn, let's just uh, let's get right into this. So, Again, as a technician, uh, I know oftentimes we're taking panels off, we're trying to access panels, we run into panels that are overlapping one another and, and create some headaches on the technician's end. But again, these aren't there just uh, arbitrarily. So can you give us a little, like, give us some insight into why some of these vehicles are built the way that they are? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of times we'll get questions with regard to the way something is put together. And so, you know, probably the best way to, to start off here is to, provide a, a definition of what shingling actually is. So when you're talking about shingling, you're, you're actually talking about the layering of the placement of the materials. And this could be in a floor section, it could be uh, a body side uh, area where, where you're, uh, you know, your inner and outer sills, and maybe there's a, a piece that runs down through the center and uh, a B pillar the way that it's shingled. And you're looking at this and you're like, why did they do that this way? And, and, uh, it, and there, there really is is some some reasons behind it, and I'll try to touch on those a little bit today. So, um, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just I'll share my screen real quick here, just to give you a little bit of an idea. Yes, please do. Okay, can you see that? Okay, we can. Okay, so on on the left hand side, if you take a look at that in Figure One, this is a cutaway of an area, and and this is something that that uh, um, just just starting to do on this particular one here, and and part of the reason is that we wanna we wanna share this information with shops, and we wanna make sure that people understand that that uh, you know we know that that shingling and uh, replacement of sections can sometimes be kind of tough. And so we'll, we'll try to get as much information out there as we can. But if you take a, a look at figure one, you'll see that uh, there, there was a, a section of the floor uh, on this particular vehicle that's cut away. This is on a Grand Cherokee. And uh, there's uh, 18 millimeters of material that's been left. And so the, uh, the upper rail, um, which uh, I don't know, see where it says uh, existing rail, uh, top cover piece, that, that's the actual upper cap. And then underneath that, of course, is, is uh, directly below that is the rear frame section. And so they, they sandwich this, uh, this floor pan in between the two. And so it's like, well, wow, you know, if I had that floor pan laying up here uh, where these spot welds are, I could just cut those spot welds out and pull the, pull the pan out. But you guys have got it shingled in between there, so it makes it more difficult. So uh, let me, let me give, first of all, give you a couple reasons as far as why that's like that. So uh, oftentimes, and this is the case uh, with this particular vehicle, this upper this upper cap, I'll call it, um, has an MPA, uh, um, a megapascal rating, which uh, is, is 
tensile strength based on on you know how much how much uh, that material can withstand uh, and so this particular one is, is uh, up around 500 uh, in that area uh, as well as the lower rail and so you've got a, a, a much higher strength cap and a lower uh, and a much higher strength lower rail uh, that, are, that are coming together and so what happens is if they use a um, a floor pan that is of lesser strength. Let's say that the MPA, and I don't know exactly what this one is right now without looking it up, but let's say it's it's in the 300 range. Then you would want to put that piece in between those two flanges, flanges that have the higher MPA rating. And that will give you the crash result that you want based on, on testing. And so uh, that's the reason why they layer things in, in the manner that they do. So in this particular case, what they're doing is they're allowing uh, an 18 uh, millimeter flange to, to stick out from the original. This is all cut away. And then this is the replacement piece that's been trimmed and cut on the right hand figure, figure two, uh, with that piece. It's just laying in there at the moment. Um, and. Uh, uh, getting ready for for this uh, this particular uh, study to to go forward. So um, I don't know if that that helps or not. But uh, uh, Jason, uh, any questions uh, on on that particular photo there? Or those two photos? No, I don't think uh, I don't think necessarily. So um, I guess one question that we might have from the audience we haven't gotten this one yet. But like when it comes to like the service engineering side of things how involved are you in you know the initial development versus post development are you oftentimes at the table early on or are you you know kind of dealing with the, with the engineers designing the vehicle when it comes to repair procedures themselves yeah so when when a new vehicle is is <clears throat> in the process of being uh developed and we have different meetings and these meetings comprise are comprised of, of production engineers and, and every production engineer has their own area. So you'll have an engineer that, that is responsible for the frame rail. You'll have an engineer that's responsible for the floor pan. Um, you'll have an engineer that's responsible for glass or, or whatever. And so in the very early stages, when we're developing these, these components and in, in this vehicle, um, you know, we, we look at how they're shingled. We, we uh, discuss the repairability, uh, how it affects service and so forth. So all of this is, is from the very beginning stages uh, are, are pretty well thought out. And, and uh, a lot of questions come up. Uh, oftentimes, you know, you wind up going back to the table, taking a second look, working with the engineers uh, to get that design finalized. I think what's important to, to again note consistently is again that the, the vehicle design engineers are building you know, um, the collision energy management in the vehicles, they're, they're placing parts and different materials and different thicknesses and different stack configurations to help, you know, manage that collision energy management. And and they're not building the vehicle for repairability all the time. You know, they got to put that, that, that customer first and foremost to make sure that they're protected. But certainly there is an aspect of the serviceability that, that they're, uh, you know, Lynn and his team are involved in as well to make sure that there are repair procedures and, and, um, I don't know how much Lynn's going to be able to dive into today, but he's been working diligently on updating some of the Solantis spot repair manuals and going a lot more in depth as well to help us as close repair technicians uh, be better equipped to repair those vehicles. Um, and, and, you know, and Lynn, is this something that you take into consideration as you're building those new manuals as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, every every time that we, we take a look at something, uh, there can be all these peripheral uh, questions and and technical um, technical attributes that that we have to deal with and so uh, for instance uh, in, in I'll uh, let, let me just uh, if you don't mind I'm going to share my screen again here um, and this is let me see There we go. So, um, in, in, can you see that? Okay. So, in, in this particular yep, instance, um, yeah. So, in this particular instance, uh, and, and this would would be something. This is actually done in CAD, and so we identify, you know, our distances and so forth uh, beforehand, and and this is all discussed with the body and weight engineers as we go forward, as well as the placements of of such things as spot welds, the size of the spot welds. 
uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, a couple of things here that, I, that for instance, I, I just might point out, and hopefully this will be helpful too. Uh, I'm going to go back to the to the photograph here uh, of this particular cutaway. So this 18 millimeter area, it looks a lot wider, I, I think, in this picture and what it actually is. But, you know, when, you, when you're laying this this kind of repair out one of the things that uh, we look at is is placement of welds so in this particular case you can see where these these spot welds from the factory from the manufacturing side are actually put together and they're not exact right i mean they you know they they, they can vary a little bit as, as they uh, are placed in there so typically what we want to uh, guys to do and, and and again these are all discussions that we have uh, during development and certainly when we we look at the the repair or, or potential uh, uh issues coming down the road uh you know based on a certain type of impact and so forth that we talk about and so what we want to do here is we we want to make sure that our placement is correct so we want to go in between these welds when we're prepping our panel so uh if if we i'm going to jump back down to this this picture here so in in between here you can see that we want to actually make our, our holes in, in between those factory pinch welds. The other thing that I think is important for people to think about is the size of the hole. And so you know, if you look at, if you think about 18 millimeters, if you have a, uh, anything there, you can actually, if you have a, a ruler that you can actually identify 18 millimeters, it's not very big, not a big area. So one of the things you have to be careful of is how close are you to the edge? So if you center, if you center your where you're going to drill this hole on this flange. You want to make sure that you're not so close to the edge that, that you're within, let's say, two millimeters, right, if you're very, very close. In fact, the, the threshold is three millimeters. So if you cut, let's say, a three-eighths hole, uh, which is a, a typical Blair uh, spot weld uh, cutter and, uh, and and guys are you know typically use five sixteenths or three eighths and you're within two to three millimeters of this outside edge you want to go down a size so you want to go down to a five sixteen so you want to make sure that you're you're inboard of this cut line for instance um, you know within within three millimeters and that that of course is uh, helps with the durability of the repair and uh, you know the heat affected zone of course is going to be uh, uh, actually uh, out of that area um, when you're when you actually consider you know mig welding this now this is a spot here be kind of difficult to get with a squeeze type because it's inboard so far um, but uh, uh, you know if you're mig welding this you you would you know certainly want to take into account the size of the, the preparation of the hole the other thing too is uh, Jason mentioned earlier a little bit with regard to weld through primers and so I want to touch on that um, when, when uh, we make a recommendation, and, and if you have gone into service library, and if you're looking, for instance, to replace a frame rail on uh, on the, the new Grand Cherokee front one, we've got pretty explicit directions in there on how to do that for changing out the shock tower area. And so if you read through that, uh, it'll talk a little bit about well through primers and so forth. And I think that, you know, one of the things that, that uh, it can be unfortunate is the name well through primer. So what we don't want you to do is weld through it, right? We, we want to make sure that you're actually welding to that parent metal in this particular case. So we want to make sure that that area is cleaned out. So we have a recommendation and typically it, it's based on different kinds of uh, techniques that people use. But what we want people to do is to make sure that they, they do have the area where that weld is going to actually you know the electrode is actually going to hit start that weld cycle you want to make sure that you're you're welding into bare metal and, and leave yourself uh, a few millimeters around the outside of that so that you don't get any contamination from from any kind of uh, zinc rich primers and things like that so hopefully that helps yeah so let's talk a little bit more about the weld through primer so historically you know Stellantis has, has said do not use weld through primer um, where are you at in that research? Where is there a release date? Are you going to be updating? Is it going to be a universal change? Talk us through a little bit of what, what you can share with us about well through primer and your studies and, and where you're heading with that. Yeah, so again, we're, you know, as we go forward and we, we take a look at different repair techniques based on that 
particular component that we're actually working with, if it's a frame rail or in this case, uh, a floor study, uh, we're going to be putting out information as far as the use of those primers. Uh, I'm hoping down the road that we'll have a general statement. But right now, uh, uh, it's not that we don't want people to use zinc rich primers or, or to protect against corrosion anytime that they have a flange we we want people to use that to to uh, re reduce any uh, corrosion that can take place due to the sandwiching of, of these materials um, so by all means we we'd like to have you use that but we what we don't want people to do though is to actually uh, have that material uh, get mixed into the weld so that could affect its uh, uh, durability, could create porosity and so on and so forth. So uh, make sure that you're cleaned out around that area, maybe a few uh, millimeters beyond uh, the circumference of that that actual weld pump. Okay, so for the time being, it's gonna be in the procedure if I'm, if I'm to use weld through primer, it'll be part of the procedure for the foreseeable future until you can have, like I said, a, a universal statement. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. As we go forward uh, and, and we get uh, more information, more study information back uh, based on our findings, then we'll make a more general statement. Okay. And are you, if you can, again, if you can share with us, are you researching, like, are you going to have a product specified or just a zinc uh, rich well two primer? Are you going to go more generic or going to be product specific on this one? Um, we'll probably, we'll, uh, it's hard to say at this point. Uh, right now, we refer to it as zinc rich primer. Um, okay. Going forward, uh, as we do our testing, we'll probably call out particular brands. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, again, I, I applaud you certainly for all the research and diligence on that. And I think you're, you're, you're right. The, the weld through part of it has always been a, a sticky point for, for a lot of people when, when in regards to, to using weld through primer. Um, we get questions all the time. Well, you know, hey, how come these OEMs recommend it and, and Stellantis doesn't? So um, it's good that it's a little more uniformity, I think, with other OEMs as well. So I think it makes technicians' jobs a little bit easier. And it gives us a, an additional layer of, of uh, you know, like a little bit of corrosion protection in there. And uh, certainly we're, we're removing that from the weld spots so that we're not creating any um, contaminants in there. But um, I, I, I applaud the OEs, in particular Stellantis in this case, for, again, remaining diligent, continually updating and researching things and making sure that uh, you got repair recommendations. So uh, thanks. Thanks for doing that, Lynn. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, we've always said, you know, if you do have uh, zinc coating on a panel in that, you know, around that weld area, we've always said to remove that around the, the area where it's going to be welded. So where that plug weld, for instance, is going to be, we want to make sure that we do take that zinc uh, off there, re remove it thoroughly, uh, so that we have uh, ferrous metal only that, that we're welding. So, uh, you know, that's always been in there, but but certainly we want to address the zinc rich primer issue as well. Yeah. Awesome. Um, you know, um, go back to the, to the, to the uh, shingling conversation a little bit. Um, again, can you maybe, again, what you can share with us, can you offer some insight into, you know, how some of your procedures are developed with, as far as the testing and, and things of that nature? But we talked yesterday with the 3M group about structural adhesive versus panel bonding adhesives and the extensive amount of research and testing that goes into it and the different wedge testing. What are some of the testing that you would do if you're going to develop a new procedure for a vehicle that's coming out? Um, I think our, our technicians would really be interested to get a little bit of insight from the OEM about what exactly does take place because we still do get questions about, you know, where, where these procedures come from. Can you walk us through a little bit of what you can share with us on that? Yeah, sure. And so a lot of times when, when we're looking at the replacement of a, a component, especially structural components, they're so important to be uh, uh, repaired, replaced in, in a manner that uh, uh, runs parallel with, with the manufacturing, how it was originally manufactured. So, um, one of the things I always tell people to look at, and I'll kind of go back to, you know, your, your weld bonding uh, uh, question. Uh, when we work with uh, different manufacturers that produce those kinds of materials, we have our testing guidelines that, that they have to follow so that, um, you know, we can be assured that, that it does run parallel with the, the type of adhesives that's used on the manufacturing line. So th those aren't the same, right? So just like paint systems on uh, during manufacturing, they're typically, uh, they run through a bake cycle. And so they, they're not a 2K, they're not a two component uh, 
adhesive. They're, they're much like paint. So, you know, we use an isocyanate, for instance, in, in paint. Well, it's the same way with, with in, in the reef, on the refinish side, and it's the same way with, with adhesives when, when you're, you're talking about structural adhesives. So we, we don't bake at, at 400 degrees, right, in, in a body shop for, for uh, curing our, our adhesive. So we're, we're simulating that strength by doing it with a 2K product. And so there are a number of those out on the markets. So we've identified those um, that we're using. And so uh, one of the things that we do is we we want to make sure that shops are, are simulating what's done at the manufacturing level. So if you take apart, let's say, a, a frame rail and you see that it has what we call red glue adhesive in, inside, it's, it's kind of it's red in color. Um, it's a structural adhesive that's used. Those areas just, you know, to make it very general, kind of a general statement, those are the areas that you want to use that crash resistant type coating that, or uh, uh, adhesive, I'm sorry, uh, that goes in there. We want to use that, that 2K um, impact resistant um, material that, that really replaces that that red glue and does a good job doing that. Uh, sometimes we'll get questions, sorry, well, what should I do if it's in an area of a vehicle and they've got a sealer in there? Should I use um, a structural adhesive uh, that I would normally use in in, in an area of, of uh, a frame rail, and our answer to that by no, not necessarily. We, we we want you to follow more what the manufacturer originally did. So you can use a 1K, for instance, if if it was uh, originally in an area where it may have had a sealer and it was the design of that sealer was to keep out moisture, not necessarily uh, in there for for strength. Okay, it was more in there for for uh, corrosion resistance and keeping out moisture and things like that. Or if it's if uh, if it's a quarter panel, for instance, and you're using a panel bond. Um, is do you have to use like a structural or a uh, uh, a type of uh, again uh, uh, a type of uh, adhesive that would be used in a frame rail? No, you could use a a quarter panel, a, an actual uh, bonding material uh, used just for quarter panels and things like that um, in those areas as well. So we want to make sure that that people follow that. As far as when, when we go through and we, we look at uh, procedures and we develop procedures uh, in a particular area, we oftentimes are looking at um, putting it back together at the factory seams. Now there are frame tips on a car and the body and weight engineers, they know exactly where the different hardnesses of those metals start and end. And so they'll identify where those cut lines need to be and where we make that splice. So when you look at something, you're like, okay, where did they come up with 431 millimeters? You know, why, why is it rounded that way? Well, they came up with that based on information that they have on that particular metal and, and to get that uh, structural integrity back to where it was originally. So they're the ones that actually call that out in, in those repairs. Uh, and then they work with with uh, uh, my team and, and we go through it and we, we uh, uh, do those uh, procedures along with them to make sure that they're, they're easily replicated in the field. Uh, as far as like something that, that might be a full frame rail or replacement, we try as much as possible to do that at the, at the factory seams and we'll all uh, identify as well uh, the, uh, the method of welding and, uh, and the type of uh, area, type of weld that they need to use in a specific area. Okay. Yeah, again, I think Slantis and, and, and many other OEMs do a great job of calling out the procedures and, um, you know, the tools, the equipment, the products, materials, the cut lines, everything. And uh, again, kudos to you for that. I know you're working diligently on, on making some um, improvements in that area as well. And uh, again, on behalf of uh, technicians out there, uh, certainly want to want to thank you for that. So um, one thing that we had talked about as far as the panel replacement, that when I did, did get a little bit of prep in advance on, uh, so I just want everybody to know I'm not spraying this question on them, but uh, we've been getting a lot of questions on RAM box sides, um, what the procedure is for putting on a RAM box side. Um, you know, there's information, there's there's adhesive identification as far as locations. How should we be putting box sides on these trucks? Should they be welded? Should they be weld bonded? Should they be adhesively bonded? Um, are there different options? Can you walk us through a little bit about the, the panel box sides on, on RAM pickups? Yeah, so oftentimes we'll we'll get calls on on uh, box sides, and, and people will be looking for exact procedures and and uh, uh, a call out on on all of those kinds of uh, 
of attributes going forward as far as making the repair itself. So um, the, the thing that I can say probably in general is to to try to simulate as close as possible what the OE did. You, again, you don't have to use a structural uh, adhesive that would be used in a frame area if it's not called out for that. Typically, it wouldn't be on a box side. So uh, if, in fact, uh, the uh, when you remove the box side, you can kind of get an idea of, of where those sealers are used and, and the types of sealers. And so, uh, you know, again, you know, try to, to simulate that. If you can get in there, uh, any of the spot welds, it could be done with a squeeze type uh, spot welder, then, then certainly use that. Uh, if there are other areas that uh, require uh, MIG welding, then we would, we would typically call out ER70. Um, and uh, typically people use uh, ER76 uh, uh, with that. So uh, um, yeah, follow, follow basically the, the procedure that, uh, or, or the, the type of weld uh, and, uh, and, and uh, material that's used from the OE as close as you can. Okay, so we wanna duplicate those joints as much as possible. Adhesive where adhesive came from, spot welds were accessible and plug welds where we can't. Yeah, exactly, yep. Okay, okay cool. All right. Um, we do have uh, <clears throat> a couple of questions coming on. I'm gonna. This was, the first one's a little bit lengthy, so I'm gonna try to try to summarize it. But essentially, uh, the question is around unicide installation. So if I have, I, we recognize that Stellantis does have sectioning procedures available, readily available for most vehicles for the unicide of the vehicle. Uh, the question is, if I have to put the entire unicide on, and that's lapped underneath back to the shingling again. So if I've got the roof over the top of our unicide. Uh, the question is, is that going to be a sacrificial, sacrificial panel? Um, I don't. I, I think I've got my answer, but I don't, want, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So, again, if I'm putting an entire unit slide on, I have to remove the roof. Um, is that a sacrificial part at that point? Yeah, sure. So I had one today, uh, in <laughs> fact, and it was uh, Grand Cherokee. And so they had a unicide that they were replacing on it. And the question was, do I have to remove the roof to, to change that unicide out? And, and you do. OK, it, it, the roof does become a sacrificial uh, component. And the reason for that is the way it shingled. And uh, on, on this vehicle, is, as well as a, a lot of uh, our vehicles, you'll see that on the B pillar, for instance, you'll have a flange that comes out underneath the roof panel. There's no way to get to those spot walls without removing that roof. And so if, if you were to cut it or, or to try to uh, re-engineer it yourself by by cutting that short and, and trying to, to save the roof panel, you, you're actually not replacing that structural integrity the same as what it was originally. So you would have to, uh, you would have to sacrifice that roof so to speak. Yep, great. And again, you've got the section procedures available. Uh, so, you know, if anything, if a little bit lower, not an issue. But when we do have to get into a full unit side replacement, yeah, that roof's going to have to be replaced. <clears throat> um, the other one, uh, not really a, a comment, but a question. I'll just kind of address it. So as far as, you know, OEM procedures versus recommendations, I think follow the OEM procedures. Um, it's documented step by step. Again, they've got the call for the, the, the steps required. Um, different links available. So when you're getting in the OEM procedures, if you're if you're in a challenge with uh, with having a conversation with somebody, those OEM procedures are are what you're looking for. Um, so I'll just won't go into that in any more detail on that. Um, don't see any other questions coming in at this point. Um, Patrick, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Uh, anything that maybe you've run across in, in some of your travels that um, that complicates this or, or simplifies this? I, I, no, I think uh, Lynn did a great job, you know, <laughs> so uh, we definitely, I, I will tell you that uh, working with the OEs like I work with and working with Lynn and his team, I, I've learned a lot and uh, folks, please make sure that you are uh, following the OE procedures and you're providing that complete safe and quality repair each and every time. But uh, that's what I've got to add right there. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, since we've got you on right now, um, can you tell us a little bit about the certification network and maybe how to get involved with it if someone's looking to, to get involved and, and what your role is uh, in, 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 that, in facilitating that? As far as the certification network, if anybody does have any questions, uh, please reach out, you know, to uh, the Assured Performance uh, website or you can go to oeconnection.com you know, as well, that will have you uh, basically all the information that you'll need. Um, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, we definitely 
value what we do in the industry. And uh, we definitely, you know, want people to have the mentality of, of making sure working with the OEs and providing that complete safe and quality repair each and every time and, and a certified repair, you know, so that's always a good thing, you know. Cool. Um, awesome. Um, Lynn, what the, do you have anything else for us today? That's our, our jam packed information regarding the shingling and the well through primer. Um, and I just want to mention again, for those of you who have not seen, um, the new, um, procedures that, that, that Lynn was talking about with regard to the Grand Cherokee, um, very detailed, very extensive, um, step-by-step, -step, um, spot wells, you know, where it, he's, I mean, it's, it's incredibly detailed and I think it is exactly what we in the industry really need. And, uh, again, I applaud Lynn for his diligence in that and, and making that happen. And, uh, again, if you have not had a chance to take a look at it, um, by all means, even if you're not working on a Grand Cherokee, just take a look at it and. Um, I think you'd be quite impressed with uh, with with some of the, the details that are in there. Yeah, no, uh, I appreciate that, uh, Jason. Uh, appreciate your input, and uh, yeah, I think going forward, you know, that's what we want to do. We want to identify. I think we're in a uh, we're in a crossroads right now, right? We've got electrified vehicles, electrification that's coming uh, uh, huge. All the OEs are on board, and uh, you know, a lot of changes because of that. Uh, you know, uh, metals that uh, may not have uh, been used in, in great abundance over the past years, but certainly are now. Uh, thinner, lighter, stronger steels that are that are being introduced, and different kinds of uh, structures within those steels that that will require very, very uh, close attention on the way that you you join them going forward. So so certainly uh, we want to make sure that we do call out those specific instructions and procedures. All right, we do have another question that came in. Um, gonna put you on the spot a little bit on this one, but I think it's pretty straightforward. Can you touch on seam sealing supplied parts? Some OEMs have bulletins that require replacing seam sealers on replacement parts. Some original parts come with no seam sealer. Are we required to seam seal replacement parts and is there documentation from Stellantis? So again, I've got a part that comes in, in um, a seam sealer question. Do I, do I have to duplicate that OEM seam sealer after attachment? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, you you want to use the material that's as, as closely related to what the, the OE used at the manufacturing level. And so we want to do the same thing as, as we, we do those repairs. So absolutely. Awesome, cool. Uh, okay, I've got no other questions. We have anything on any other channels? No, we're good. All right, um, Lynn, do you have any uh, anything else you want to add? Any uh, any other updates you could share with us, uh, or any other details? Uh, not at this time. Just to appreciate the opportunity to uh, work with Collision Hub. You guys have done a great job, and appreciate the conversation every time we get together. And uh, and certainly uh, welcome any questions that people have uh, down the road, and and uh, want to help as much as we can. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate your time and, and Patrick, your time as well. And again, Lynn, I think what you're doing at Stellantis um, is, is great work and I really appreciate it. And I know that uh, you're making a lot of our lives a lot easier uh, with, with those detailed instructions and um, updates and staying on top of that. So very much appreciated for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you again. Cool. Thank All you, right. Jason. So we will... Thank you, Patrick. Too. Uh, we will be back at two o'clock uh, with Scott Van Hooley from iCar, uh, and then another show at four thirty, and another one at six thirty this evening. So uh, we will see you at two o'clock Central Time. Take care, everybody. Thanks.